So hello and welcome to the sixth session of the Let's Talk About Alternative Methodology series. This session focuses on harnessing the power of engagement through your cost estimation process and use of cost data. Engagement of partners, providers, and parents can transform your cost estimation. My name is Heather Madison, and I am from the National Center on Subsidy Innovation and Accountability. And we are happy to bring this series to you in collaboration with the Office of Child Care and the National Center on Early Childhood Quality Assurance. Just a few housekeeping items. The call, call is being recorded and will be made available to anyone not able to participate today. As participants, you are able to turn on your video and unmute yourself. We do ask that you remain on mute and use the chat to ask questions and make comments. We'll be collecting comments and questions throughout the webinar. So as soon as you have a question, just go ahead and post it right into the chat um, and we will pause and make sure we have opportunities to, um, to answer those questions. Uh, you can turn on closed captioning at any point to assist you and we'll also have opportunities to uh, have you come off mute and ask questions if you have trouble with the chat. This is the sixth in an ongoing series of conversations about cost-based alternative methodologies, and we hope this series will support you in use of cost data. At the conclusion of the webinar, you will receive a link for an evaluation, and we encourage you to complete the evaluation and let us know what worked and what can be improved in this series. I wanna take a moment to go over uh, our agenda for today, where I'm going to do some introductions and then we're going to jump right into the material. We'll talk a little bit about the purpose of engagement, ways to engage, types and benefits of engagement. And then we'll jump into the engagement through the process, who to engage, requirements, defining goals and evaluation. Today, our presenters are Nina Johnson, National, uh, Early Childhood Quality Assurance Specialist, uh, Matt Judge from Washington Department of Children, Youth, and Families, and Autumn Kazi as a Washington State Child Care Provider. So thank you presenters for joining us. And they'll be able to introduce themselves a little bit more as we jump into our conversations. Our objectives today are to understand the benefits of engaging providers and partners and to learn about strategies for engaging those providers and partners in cost estimation. Before we get into all of the material, I wanna take a moment and do some engagement ourselves. And in the chat, I'd love for you to share what is your favorite winter meal? So if you wanna jump in the chat and share that, that would be great. I know for me, my my favorite meal ever is pizza, but my favorite min winter meal is probably like a stew. It's just so warm and comforting. Oh, I see lots of soups and chili. Oh, chili potato soup. Mm. Wow. <laughs> Ramen. That's awesome. Uh, peppermint latte definitely counts. Uh, I didn't even think of that, but definitely peppermint latte uh, would be up there on mine or hot chocolate too. So thank you for participating. Uh, I appreciate that. And definitely jump right into the chat. Any shop thoughts you have or questions throughout, uh, feel free to share them when you have them. Of gingerbread everything. Oh my goodness. There's so many. And definitely keep the food coming because you're making me hungry. And I live on the East Coast, so it's going to be dinner time after this webinar for me. So I appreciate this. <laughs> yeah, me too. Coffee and soup. So I'm actually going to turn this over to Dina Johnson uh, to talk a little bit about the purpose of engagement. Nina? Thank you, Heather. Um, so there are ways throughout the alternative methodology process to engage families and child care providers and the communities. And just to make it easier, I'm just going to use the term partners for all three of those groups here. So most often we think of engaging providers as 
sharing their partners is sharing their budgets for cost models, but there is much more to that, to engagement than that. So multiple decisions must be made and partners can inform those decisions. Partners can help you think about your cost assumptions, such as average enrollment compared to staff capacity, the hours worked by family child care provider, what they pay for rent and lease, and many, many other assumptions. Um, assumptions where it may be more difficult to get um, administrative data. You could bring together partners to discuss the terms associated with the alternative methodology. This includes terms used in the survey, in focus groups, in interviews, and in the report. Um, the idea is that the terms used need to make sense to providers, and they should be clearly defined and explained so that families, providers, and the community understand what they mean. And just as a side note, a glossary could be developed and used in the draft report that um, partners can give input on. You can involve partners in developing a survey to collect cost data. They can help you develop a user-friendly survey and advise you about ways to distribute the survey. And also providers can serve as ambassadors to encourage other providers to complete the, complete the surveys. Partners can review the results of the cost analysis and provide feedback. And their questions can guide the revision to the analysis and the development of the report. Partners can provide input into policy recommendations that are proposed. And partners can provide feedback on the draft report. We'll move to the next one. So this slide shows a continuum of engagement from communicating to coordinating to collaborating with partners. And I think it's helpful to tease these apart so you understand where you are currently and where you want to be. And you may kind of go in between all three of these. So let's talk briefly about the key characteristics of each type of engagement. Communicating focuses on building awareness and understanding by exchanging information and ideas. The partner isn't expected to modify their work in this example of in, this, in communicating. So this could include sharing information about why you're doing a cost study and sharing the results of the cost study. Coordinating means identifying a shared goal or purposes, sharing plans, listening to partners' viewpoints, and seeking feedback. Partners are making independent decisions but taking into account others' ideas. This could include sharing the goals of a cost study, seeking feedback on a draft cost questionnaire, and making changes so it's based on the partner's feedback, or making changes based on the partner's feedback, and then also communicating the changes that you made in response to their feedback. And then collaborating builds on communicating and coordinating. So here you're sharing ideas and seeking feedback and also working toward a shared goal. The partners here are mutually invested and they share in decision-making, planning, implementation, and reporting. An example of this would be working with an advisory group to create, create a plan for cost modeling and financing where each member is invested and shares equally in decision-making. And we're gonna move on to a poll question for you all now. So thinking about the engagement types that we just talked about, what type of engagement does your agency use for cost estimation? Do you um, communicate? Do you coordinate? Do you collaborate? Do you do something else? Or do you do all of the above? And Heather, I'm not sure if I'm able to see the responses, so I'll rely on you to report out. Uh, we'll uh, give it just like 30 more seconds for anybody to participate. It does look like right now uh, that most votes are really around the all of the above. Okay, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's probably what most agencies are doing. I think that um, and I'll be interested in hearing from Washington <laughs> about what they're doing. I think it's probably a mix of all three, though. Sure. Does look like 100% uh, of participants say they have done all of the above of, of okay. different types of engagement. Okay, that's great. Thanks for participating. Okay, so I'm just going to talk briefly about the benefits of engagement. I think you probably already have an idea about what the benefits are, but it may be help, helpful just to be a little bit concrete about it. 
So you can design more realistic cost models and more effective policy and fund solution, funding solutions when you engage partners throughout the process. Providers and partners are more likely to accept the results because the model is representative of their program. So that is, they can see themselves in the assumptions and the data because they gave feedback. And when they see themselves in the results, they can recommend policy and funding solutions. Providers and partners can improve their knowledge about cost estimation. You can foster connections among and with providers when you create a collaborative environment. And Autumn may have something to say about this. Um, and then providers trust in your agency and your agency's decisions may improve. And Heather, I'll turn it over to you. Great, so I'm actually going to turn it to Matt and Autumn. And so Matt, how about we start with you? And if you wanna give us a little bit of context of engagement with providers and partners within Washington State, and then tell us a little bit about what you have benefited from that engagement and how it's changed over time. Sure. So thanks, everyone, for having me. Again, I'm Matt Judge. Um, I'm the CCDF Administrator for Washington State and also oversee Head Start Collaboration Office and our preschool development grant. Um, and I've been involved along with our subsidy administrator um, and a really awesome uh, design team that's convened by Child Care Aware of Washington, our Washington State's Child Care Resource and Referral. Um, and I'll, um, in a minute, give some kind of context um, to that work. Um, so one of the things I kind of wanted to say from the outset, uh, I'm one of the 100% that said we're doing all of the above kinds of engagement uh, on alternative methodology. Uh, one of the things is just that the process itself has many, many steps involved from initial research to, you know, uh, uh, doing the, the survey and study, making policy decisions, getting information there. And, you know, it's a years long process and there are many um, potential opportunities for engagement in there and that all the different types will come into, into play. So I think that Autumn and I will be talking about sort of one phase that I think has been really the, mo uh, the most interesting for our process and the most interesting for my agency in, in terms of how we could explore a more collaborative approach. But we've done all the work for, on the, the spectrum that uh, Nina was talking about. Um, so uh, what I'll, we'll talk about today is, you know, Washington State is in the situation of having done an initial study and produced a report recommending a cost estimation model. Uh, we engaged with prenatal to five fiscal strategies, who you may have heard of, to develop that methodology. Um, and, you know, it, it asks providers lots of important questions about their costs to create the model, and it's very wide-reaching and, and, and thorough. But when you um, come up with a model like that, um, at the end of the day, you have a general model that isn't necessarily stating to you, this is what your rate will be in a given county for a given child um, age. You know, It's giving you a general framework and there are decision points or variables within these models that you need to think about. And rather than just unilaterally making a decision um, on you know, my, our agency's side about what those assumptions should be, I think the idea was to let's go to the folks who are actually experts in this, who do the work in the field and ask them to supply their recommendations from their perspective. And these mm -hmm. would be things like, what is the assumed wage for a, a, a provider and their staff? Meaning what would a subsidy base rate allow a provider to pay themselves and their staff if it were adequate enough and what's the standard there? That's like the biggest cost driver that is an unanswered question in the, in the model. And so it's good to ask providers what they think about that. So the obvious benefit from engagement is getting an actual expert in the field's um, you know, approach to this issue and the reasons that drive what their recommendation is. Uh, because those are what's going to resonate ultimately, you know, when when these folks go to the Capitol and talk to their legislators as well, those are the messages that are going to get there. And we'll understand those messages and where they're coming from from the very beginning. So I think that that is a huge benefit. Uh, one of the important things to state here is if you're like if your state's like Washington's, you aren't necessarily the decision maker. Your legislature is going to uh, apportion funds to you. And so what, um, you know, when we're in that situation in Washington State, DCYF, my agency isn't the decider about what the base rates will be, but we're going to make a recommendation. And the providers in this decision group 
uh, are really giving us information about what are the best recommendations for our recommendation. Mm -hmm. um, so this is one started process. So personally, one of the things I've gained from it is uh, just relationship building with, with providers, it's particularly during the pandemic. I wasn't, uh, we weren't as engaged um, for, mm -hmm. for the very practical reasons. So it was just really awesome to connect that way again. Um, and we did an in-person weekend session that I think was really the best, um, you know, experience in terms of the group's effectiveness, but also just the relationship building. Um, and then I'll talk about this more in a minute, but specifically around, um, I guess I'll say lifting up voices of, of Spanish speakers. I, I mm -hmm. think the whole group was really um, focused on, you know, trying to learn through the process how best uh, to have those folks participate. And that means, you know, learning to slow down, learning to create open space for those questions to come. And I think that a lot of connections were made between providers across that language uh, uh, gap um, mm -hmm. that, that was really huge. So that was um, one of the good things. And before I uh, let Autumn talk about this one, uh, I would just say from DCYF's end, you know, our engagement has changed over the course of my career with DCYF. I think we were very much on that left-hand side of Nina's chart where we were mm -hmm. just informing providers what we were doing, uh, making decisions unilaterally. Um, not always, we did we did good work, but I just think it's improving and we're doing, we're trying to do more that's in that collaborative space as best we can. And I think that, that this design group that we worked with around some of these assumptions is a great um, example of that. So I'll stop yammering for a second. <laughs> Great, thanks, Matt. So Autumn, I'm gonna turn it to you. What benefits did you gain from this process? And what do you think DCYF has gained from including providers? And how do you think that's changed? So being a part of this process has allowed me to gain some valuable insight into what other providers across the state are experiencing. As a family home provider, I wasn't aware of the issues centers were facing, and it has allowed me to learn about the inequities we experience across the board. Um, the engagement process has brought many long-term issues to the forefront, and it has allowed us to work together to find solutions, not only for us, but for the providers to come. Um, it has given me a sense of unity with other professionals in this field. I am thankful to be a part of this experience, and I think we are setting a precedent in the field of early learning for licensed child care providers. Um, this team is working to ensure equity and recognition of our hard work and dedication to the field. Uh, having DCYF as part of the process has been incredibly beneficial. Uh, we were able to talk about the issues we have experienced and we have learned ways to resolve those issues. It has been insightful to understand DCYF's standpoint in this process and to know they are trying to make things right for the providers. I believe this is the first time many providers have felt heard by DCYF. Mm -hmm. I feel validated knowing that DCYF is collaborating with us to make a change that has been so desperately needed. Um, initially, working with DCF, uh, DCYF, it made me feel a little bit leery um, in our ability to accomplish our goals with this team. But since the process has begun, I think I can speak for most, if not all of us involved with the design team, that DCYF has not only listened to our concerns, but they have worked with us to find adequate solutions. I feel like our voices are being heard. And from what I understand, this wasn't always the case in the process um, for providers who worked with DC DCYF through the issues we have been covering. Great, thank you. That, it sounds like you have, uh, both are receiving a lot of benefits um, and that has changed over time, right? That, um, and to, to the positive, of change. I'm going to um, see if anybody has any questions, feel free to raise your hand um, or go ahead and put them in the chat, uh, especially for Matt and Autumn. This is your opportunity to hear from the experts who are uh, doing this hard work. Uh, and while we wait to see if anybody has any questions on the benefits, I would love to know a little bit more of um, in those benefits, have you had, and we'll probably talk a little bit more about the challenges, but have you had a, any, are there groups that might be challenged and not necessarily feeling these benefits at this point? Or what have you done, I guess I should say, to try to address some of the, the challenges to ensure that people are feeling the benefits? And this really is for Matt, but also Autumn, 
as a child care provider, I imagine you're probably hearing from other child care providers. Um, and it would be interesting for us to hear what other child care providers are saying about this process or about engaging with DCYF. I think a lot of providers had a little bit of um, resistance to working with DCYF to begin with. Um, you know, it's kind of always been like, oh, you know, they're just here to make sure that they're policing us, you know, mm -hmm. and I think that has changed. Um, providers just want to be heard and we mm -hmm. just want to, see, you know, at the end of the day, we all have the same goal in mind and that's to provide high quality care to the children, youth and families in our communities. So, you know, it's, it's been a really neat process because at first I was like, oh gosh, you know, they're going to come on and they're going to be, oh, we're not doing any of this, you know, and it's really changed. It's been like, how can we help you? It's been really inclusive. Um, like Matt had said, you know, the, the barriers of language at our mm -hmm. last meeting that we had in person, it was great because they had interpreters there. And I heard a lot of insight from the Spanish speaking side that, you know, I didn't previously, it, it, you know, understand because mm -hmm. it was, we can't engage in that, you know, there's that barrier there. And so that was really neat. Um, I'm from a really small community. I know all of the providers in my area. And so, you know, being able to talk with them, cause I've been on this design team for the last year. And then I was on the team mm -hmm. before that initially too. So, you know, being able to talk with them and then kind of get their insight and bring it to the meetings mm -hmm. has really allowed for that collaboration that might not otherwise have happened. So mm -hmm. it's been really neat. Awesome. Matt? Yeah, just to, to piggyback on that. Um, so the child care aware um, design team has been doing awesome work on compensation long before we engaged on this. So we're DCYF is the newcomer here. Um, but one of the things that we learned when we were looking at who could we collaborate with to get mm -hmm. to work on these um, recommendations was that we received data about the representative of representativeness of this group geographically, racially, mm -hmm. ethnically, provider types, um, different types of care, like non-standard hours care or infant mm -hmm. and toddler care. But one of the super cool things is, in working with this group that I saw was providers having each other's backs in terms of, um, I myself am a not a family child care provider, one might say, or I don't do infant mm -hmm. toddler care, but I'm thinking through what this recommendation means for my colleagues who do that mm -hmm. kind of work and and not just being self-interested about I, I think I can get the best rate for myself but you know I mean maybe the the, the process is, isn't really amenable to like gaming it but I just think that these providers were like really having each other's back and so I think that that was really cool um, and just knowing that we had already taken the data to all of our advisor groups about what the composition of this group was and having them say you know we can't really um, improve on this much in terms of like you know, you've got representativeness across the state, racially, ethnically, all those things. So, yeah, I mean, we, we've had challenges, but I just think the providers stepped up. That's great. Thank you. So I don't see any questions or hands right now, so I think we're going to move on. Uh, and so uh, we're going to talk a little bit about engaging throughout the process. Uh, the first piece that we're going to talk about, and I'm just giving a little bit of context, and then we're jumping right back to Autumn and Matt. So we want to talk about the requirements that CCDF has for lead agencies. CCDF plan, the CCDF plan asks lead agencies to explain how they consulted with required stakeholders specified in the rule. Though the rule uses the term stakeholders, we intentionally substitute the word uh, to partners on this slide as a more culturally sensitive term. The rule and plan specify the following entities must be consulted prior to beginning cost gathering work. The early state's Early Childhood Advisory Council and similar coordinating body, child care, local child care provider administrators, child care resource and referral, organizations representing caregivers, teachers, and directors, and others that are appropriate for the state and territory. And of course, tribal grantee administrators should also be a partner in these conversations. It is required to engage partners and providers prior to and throughout all the steps of the process. 
And, it, and an important requirement on this slide is consideration of partners' comments. As we've heard from Matt and Autumn, Washington is doing that throughout the process and really thinking through how do they gather the information, but then use that information um, in their uh, alternative methodology. And so that's something that you want to think about is how you would take comments into consideration and make adjustments based on those comments. And as we've also heard from Autumn and Matt, inclusion of the provider community is especially important in the process. Uh, engaging providers to reflect the types of market categories you want to survey or model is, is really important to actually hear from those experts, as Matt had said. So I'm going to skip this. So we want to think about a little bit about who have you in, uh, engaged in the process or who should be engaged in the process. Um, so we should you want to engage individuals who are impacted by the decisions made. This could be parents. It's definitely child care providers, but it also could be eligibility workers and community organizations. You want to identify who might be missing from the conversation and do your best to ensure providers represent the larger population of providers served by your agency. And you might want to think about that in terms of size or location, longevity in the field, setting, race, ethnicity, language, and many other features. Uh, it could include identifying and engaging diverse groups, as we heard from Matt. They are um, specifically targeting Spanish-speaking child care providers and accommodating through translators um, so that they can have that, that uh, perspective within their uh, engagement. Uh, and think about if there's an area of your state or territory where providers don't often come to meetings and how you can eliminate barriers for their position participation. Um, and you might want to identify providers or individuals who might oppose your changes and engage them early on and help them feel ownership over any changes and be advocates for those change. And you, and finally, you might want to think about partners that you can help with engaging providers. Consider family child care networks. It sounds like Matt is using their resource and referral network to be able to engage providers and jump into an opportunity that already existed. Um, and there might be other organizations that can help you with that engagement. So we are going to jump back to Matt and Autumn and all this great information you're sharing with us. So I'm actually going to start with you, Autumn, first, if that's okay. Um, can you share a little bit about the <clears throat> providers, that part, the part of the process for providers, and how you heard about the opportunity and what interested you to be part of it? So the providers that make up our team are licensed providers across Washington state. So that can be directors, licensed family home, child care providers, center providers. Uh, we are spread out from multiple counties on both sides of the mountain. So it's, you know, all the way over in Eastern Washington, all the way up to Bellingham. Um, I'm on the coast of Washington. Um, and then we have, you know, family home providers, center owners, directors, each of them bring a different set of valuable insights and experiences to the table, which creates a diverse need uh, set of needs and ideas. It's been really impressive to watch their drive and commitment to the field. Um, you know, we have a couple of really great, outspoken, smart um, providers that aren't afraid to bring things to the table. Um, it's been really neat to hear their ideas. Um, I learned about this a couple of years ago because I was on the initial design team that they created. Um, gosh, I want to say it was like 2020, 2021. Um, and it was really insightful. I really enjoyed being a part of that team. So when I was offered a spot on this team, it was a no brainer. Of course, I'll be back. Um, it interested me because I've seen firsthand the inequities providers experience each day and I want to advocate for the change. At the end of the day, our work will not only positively impact the providers, but it will also positively impact the field of early early learning. Sorry, I'm choking over my tongue over here. 
Licensed providers are given the recognition for the professionals that we are, this field will grow, and it will create more early learning opportunities for the families in our communities. We know the importance of high quality early learning programs, and if more investments were put into practice, we would see more options available, and that's so important. So um, yeah, it's been a really great experience, and I I would love to do this long term, so. <laughs> that's great. Thank you. Matt. Can you tell us a little bit about, you know, how you see the engagement and your strategies, potentially like what you were thinking for your strategies and how that might have evolved as well for engaging? Well, so um, broadly, this design teamwork is a is one phase of the of the work. Uh, so, you know, we've done all of the other things. Uh, we have our regular advisory committee. Uh, we have an Indian policy early learning committee to get the uh, the voice of tribal nations. Um, you know, we have a, a state association of Head Start and ECAP. And so all of those partners are part of our official structure. And of course, we have engaged them at various points. We've done surveys, you know, the study that actually informed the, the initial model focus groups who sort of validated what we learned. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, really this work goes back to, you know, other work that we've done on our state's um, early learning strategic plan that mm -hmm. in included a lot of engagement. And so um, that's kind of what's called impact networks. You can take a look on Google about what that is. So, um, and then of course, this design team is, is is another phase of that. I guess what I wanted to get to about, about that is that a lot of the engagement that you're doing um, is going to lead up to this work that you do on your alternative mm -hmm. methodology and it can count. Um, so I just would invite people to think about the engagement that you do um, as being uh, already meeting some of the requirements for an alternative methodology, and you don't have to reinvent the wheel all the time. Mm -hmm. um, so, but particularly with this design team group, um, I mean, we're really lucky. Childcare Aware of Washington contracts with facilitators um, and with uh, interpreters that are just really effective at their job. And in working with those facilitators, uh, they, they told us that this team wants to use liberatory design if you've heard of that, it's a type of co-design process that is focused on an end goal of racial equity and social justice, if I can like really sum it up very briefly. And it's a set of modes of, of conduct uh, in, in collaboration and mindsets that you bring to the table. And these facilitators had us focus on those every meeting, pick out certain ones that each of us individually wanted to be focused on based on what we learned in previous meetings. Mm -hmm or deficits that we'd uncovered in ourselves or whatever it might be. And so some of those modes might be like self-awareness, like for me, understanding sort of the, um, you know, potentially unwelcome power dynamic that a state agency can mm. bring to a provider group, but, you know, it's different for everybody. Um, so I think using those approaches and having the effective um, and patient uh, facilitation, and by patient, I mean, these facil facilitators are providing lots of time for the for providers to feel like this is a space that's that's comfortable and let them have as much time as they need to sort of get prepped to 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 engage and not be on DCYF's timetable. Mm -hmm. um, so th those were really effective uh, for us. And I think that DCYF, there were two of us, my colleague Jason Romaiki, the subsidy administrator and me, I think our approach was really, we're here to be uh, uh, information for, for providers. Mm -hmm. So if there's a question about how our systems work right now in making their recommendations, we can provide that. If there are questions about like, what's ha gonna happen with our recommendations? Like, where does this go from here? How does the legislative process work? This group's pretty savvy, but if um, if we could provide any insight from, from the agency perspective on that, we do that. And I think the facilitators helped keep us in our appropriate role, not leading, but um, on the, uh, one other thing I wanted to mention is uh, our approach is, you know, providing alternatives for the providers and the analysis behind the impact of those different alternatives so that they can make informed choices. So I think the strategy of engagement is really to be a, a source of information. Yeah. It's interesting, Matt, and it sounds like for, it's working well that you have in this group really that your agency is not the lead of the group, really, that you have outside facilitators that are leading and giving voice. So it has shifted that power dynamic. Um, I'd love, Autumn, to hear your perspective of that. I mean, it, it sounds like it's working well, but 
was that a surprise to you? And it was like, would you recommend that for other oh, states? 100%. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the facilitators, they're literal godsends. They are, I mean, their attitudes, the way that they move the meetings, the way that they show everybody grace. I mean, it's just it, the whole thing as a whole, the collaboration, everything, it's just, it's wholesome. And mm -hmm. it's made the whole process feel like it's not a job. You know, this has been an opportunity. It's been a learning uh, curve for all of us. Um, the liberatory design is at first I was like, ah, oh, this is kind of dumb. <laughs> like this seems a little, uh, intense, but really mm -hmm. it's been, it's been a really great, um, learning opportunity. Mm -hmm. Um, I highly recommend if you guys can get your hands on the same facilitators, whatever you got to do. Um, they're, they're just great. And, you know, like Matt had mentioned, we did this, um, retreat and we got to meet everybody in person. It just, it just was a really great experience. Um, I have not felt like DCOIF was overstepping. I haven't felt like providers were overstepping. Mm -hmm. It just has been a really great collaborative process where everybody feels heard everybody, you know, and my favorite part is if we're, you know, so for example, at the retreat, we, we're, we were kind of struggling on a topic of, um, it was the, the time for the, for planning, um, for paid planning for the centers. Mm -hmm. And I just really liked that, you know, I can't relate to that because I don't have a center. So mm -hmm. for planning for me, I, you know, I don't need a paid sub for that, whatever I can do that on my own. But for the centers, they were really struggling with trying to establish if this was a cost driver that we wanted to invest into and whatnot. So, um, the facilitators, you know, they were a great cushion there to kind of say, okay, do we need this? Do we need that? Like, and they really helped us come to a conclusion where everybody at the end of it was like, I, you know, they were, we all were in favor and it just, it was nice because they're good at saying, okay, should we table this till mm -hmm. tomorrow? Or, you know, so that was nice to have because, um, you know, I think for providers, a lot of us are just really passionate about where mm -hmm. we stand. And so they really helped us um, see it more as a broad, you know, issue rather than, you know, my two cents, his two cents, mm -hmm. whatever. Um, so yeah, it was, it was a, it was a plus for sure. Um, they've made the world of a difference with the, with the whole process. Great. Thank you. And Matt, I'm curious from your perspective, right? Sometimes from the lead agency, we, you, you jump in and you're almost always the lead in facilitating. How was that experience for you being not the lead, but the information op, uh, giver, right? The resource there. Well, in a way it takes the pressure off um, mm -hmm. because I'm not responsible for the providers uh, having a good time uh, and, and being <laughs> effective. Uh, it's more just how can I support you in being effective? But it does put a different kind of pressure because I was talking about um, you need to facilitate how this group is going to have the tools they need to make an effective decision. So that means your analysis needs to be available. It needs to be digestible. Uh, somebody needs to be able to come to a topic for the first time and make a decision on it. Um, and so that meant more homework um, mm -hmm. uh, on the on the offline time. Um, so it's a different set of responsibilities, but I like better, I think we're better at being um, subject matter experts about our world in the agency mm -hmm. and sharing information about that than like um, driving the the bus for, for providers because they know what they need better than we do. Great. Thank you. That was really helpful. And again, I want to remind people, jump into the chat or raise your hand if you do have any questions. I am going to realize we don't have much time, so I'm going to uh, move on to this, these questions. Um, and this is, I know we've talked a little bit, Autumn and Matt, about the barriers and changes that you have, but is there anything you want to add to what we've talked about around barriers or ch how you've adapted the process that you want to share? Uh, so just for me personally. Oh, go ahead, Matt. Please go ahead. Go ahead, on. Okay. Um, for me personally, it just was a matter of fitting it into my schedule. Um, you know, mm -hmm. I'm a full-time college student. I have three kids. 
Um, my kids have extracurricular activities, um, you know, so fitting it into my schedule was hard. Um, that was really the biggest barrier was just making time. Um, it has become a priority. So, you know, in that aspect, um, it's easy for me. I think it's important to be mindful. Um, our plates are full. Everybody has things that they're doing. Um, it's been really great because this team, you know, they're flexible. If you miss a meeting, you're not in trouble. You know, it's just been um, it's, it's been an easy thing to fit into my schedule, mm -hmm. but for, for a lot of people, there probably are a lot of barriers to, um, fully participate. And I just think it's important to give them grace. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it's, it's definitely, um, there's been time, like our meeting last night was canceled and I was, I wasn't mad about it. I was like, Oh good. Now I can take my son to wrestling and not have to be on a zoom meeting on the drive mm -hmm. home, you know? So okay. Yeah, definitely planning it into my, my daily stuff is, is the biggest barrier, but we make it work. So Matt, for you. Yeah. Um, some of the, some of the things that Autumn mentioned, um, I would say that, um, in addition to the time commitment, just respecting providers as professionals means that, um, finding ways to su support them with stipends, uh, I think is, mm -hmm. is really critical. Fortunately, our the structure in this team already supported that, and Washington State is is developing some recent some recent legislation made it easier for us to do better stipends. So I just think we're in a better position than some states might be. But I think I think just showing respect that way is is uh, mm -hmm. a gesture that's that that might help. Um, I think another challenge here. I alluded to it before um, with DCYF not being the decision maker, but somebody who produces a recommendation to the legislature to fund base rates at a certain level on a, using a certain methodology. I think that it's it can be challenging for providers to feel, I imagine it would be challenging to feel trust um, to, mm. that the agency can shepherd these recommendations to completion. Because frankly, there are things going on in the world that no one here can control that can have a huge impact on the revenue that's going to happen in the state. And mm -hmm. we just don't know what size of bread basket might be available in 2025 when, when we make these, these asks. And so I just think, you know, it, it, it's, I think that makes it hard for um, decision for us to reach decisions in this group, not knowing what's going to happen in, in the end. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I think it's, and then it's a challenge for DCYF to sort of communicate like what we do have control over and what we don't have control over. And you're, you're talking about those things in the midst of a relationship that's sometimes been fraught in the past. And so mm -hmm. I think that that's just something that needs to be navigated. I think also we're the regulatory agency. And so any conversation that comes in, that we come to, I think that we uh, bring that with us. And so yeah. the question I think is natural, like if we're talking about raising base rates, are you, are you also going to be talking to me about new requirements? Mm -hmm. And are there, if, if there are new, you know, and if that happens, is the base rate compensation gonna even be sufficient to, to support that? So we had to be clear that this conversation is about base rates, but we don't mm -hmm. have any control about what the legislature might do in the future around requirements. So we're having that conversation not knowing what's around the corner there. Mm -hmm. So I just think those all make it a bit of a fraught conversation, but I think that these providers are really effective at saying like, whatever else happens, what I imagine as the best situation for my field and for mm -hmm. me, providers like me, is if we could get cost of care being the mm -hmm. basis for our rates. And then if living wage and like just you know, sort of baseline uh, program supports were built mm -hmm. into our subsidy base rate, we'd be in a better place come what may. And so, yeah, I think um, that was, a, it's a barrier, but this group worked through it. Last thing, things really came together when we were in person. Mm -hmm. uh, we did a lot of effective debates and a lot of effective analysis in that virtual si situations. But when it, when it was in person, these providers were expert at like, okay, we're transitioning to a decision now. Mm -hmm. uh, debate was intense, but now we're moving on. So I think sometimes that's, that can be a challenge to have that happen virtually. Yeah, definitely. I Thank think you. the, the retreat was really important. Um, it allowed us a different level of collaboration. I just think it was a lot more personable. Um, and then they also, they paid for our hotel. They gave us a gift card for food. We were uh, reimbursed for our mileage. 
Um, I think taking away those barriers um, was hugely important um, mm -hmm. for a lot of providers. So um, that might be something I told them next time they need to just put us up in Hawaii. So, you know, we'll see, but, <laughs> but, you know, that kind of engagement and collaboration was really great. Um, the in-person was, it, it really was um, just a really fulfilling weekend mm -hmm. for all of us, I think. So. That's great. Thank you. And so Nina, I see you have a question. Uh, do you want to go ahead and ask it? Sure. I put it in the chat and Autumn, I see that you responded. And so if there's anything else you want to add, that'd be great. And Matt, do you want to share your response too? But I'm just curious if you've engaged family child care providers in a different way than you've engaged centers, thinking about um, maybe the, their hours or the like cost modeling that applies or cost that applies specifically to family child care or other considerations. So there are several angles to that question. So when this design team came together, there were different assumptions for cost drivers for the center and child care providers. And so, you know, the whole group brought together um, family child care and centers uh, to have those conversations at the same time. So I feel like the, you know, the family child care providers would sort of step up when the question came to family child care. But I did mention earlier that center providers um, were good about being like, hey, I'm thinking about this um, in terms of somebody else's model that's totally different from mine and trying mm -hmm. to put myself in that place. So there's that. And then in Washington state, family child care providers who accept subsidies are in a union, SEIU 925. And we did consult with them about this group being the group. Um, and they did agree to it when they saw how representative it was. I think some of their members are, are in there. Uh, so they have a separate, uh, you know, sort of consultation like that. And mm -hmm. then, of course, it's a really important point here. Coming up in the spring, we will engage in collective bargaining with that group. Mm -hmm. And so all these recommendations have to um, sort of uh, fit into the into that context as well. When we go to negotiate with family child care providers, uh, we'll have in mind the recommendations that this group made in thinking about the contract items that 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 SEIU 925 wants to bring to the table and sort of you know what the size of the bread box box uh, bread basket is in that situation so so yes there's lots of engagement that is uh together and separate um and in the same context and in different contexts that's super helpful. Thank you. I'd forgotten about um, the fact that providers, family child care providers were unionized in Washington. So that's interesting to consider. Thank you. We are going to um, talk a little bit about goals. I'm going to uh, not jump into too much of this, but really that we want to highlight that it's really important to define your goals for cost estimation and that, that your goals can really guide how you engage with partners and providers and parents and how that engagement can support you. Um, and then there are some practical considerations, quite a few that we've just heard from Autumn and Matt around sharing your goals, using a very respectful approach to, that honors the providers. I mean, I just heard right off the bat, right? Matt talked about how they are the experts uh, in this and that, that we need to honor that they are the, the experts. Um, ensure that meetings are accessible, and that means time, language, format, having a clear agenda, acknowledging those differences, sharing re your results, and thinking about the timelines. I mean, just heard about those challenges of those timelines, but trying to ensure that your timelines allow for changes based on engagement, thinking about, you know, you want to engage based on things that can change and not necessarily go into, you know, get somebody's feedback and ask for feedback when there's not a lot of room for actual change. So I am gonna go back to Autumn and Matt and think about, you know, what were your goals for this process and what has worked well? Uh, how about Matt, we'll start with you first. Well, I, I kind of hit on some of these, so I, I'd be repeating myself, but I think that um, building some rapport and trust with providers, I think was um, what something we wanted to see out of the process. Um, and we knew that there were certain challenges like that I've mentioned. Um, so I think that I think that um, some of that's working well. 
Um, I just, I think the structure of sort of power in general mm -hmm. uh, in, in government um, makes that a little bit of a fraught conversation um, because the values that the providers are going to bring um, come up against the preset notions of policymakers and DCYF mm -hmm. is kind of navigating this territory in between uh, to try to make um, effective things happen. Um, but at the end of the day, the goals are really around, um, you know, what's fair and what's right. And I and I think that living wage and benefits for these workers are are what's fair and what's right. And and that is a necessary step for DCYF to get to its mission around outcomes for children. Uh, if providers aren't compensated fairly and don't have the benefits they need to, you know, um, lead their lives, then there just isn't going to be access to the kind of care that families need. We're going to continue to see deserts deserts for particular child age groups. So I hope that we're able to build trust in that we have a mission in common around that. Providers are super passionate about the, the kids and families that they work with. Um, and so I, I like to think that DCYF shares that from a different perspective and, and that that was clear in the work together. Um, and like I said, I just think, you know, giving the floor to the providers uh, to have to have the discussions uh, works well. Um, mm -hmm. DCYF gets plenty of voice in just by providing the analysis and the information um, and the providers bring the wisdom to, to make decisions about what recommendations DCYF um, should should bring to the table. So yeah, I think that that's working, working well. Um, I think we have a challenge ahead of us. Sometimes it's unpredictable knowing what kind of the political process will be mm -hmm. in terms of we get the recommendations from this group and then we start to talk to the governor's office and sort of start to understand the logistics of the legislative session that's going to come back. Mm -hmm. And how do we convey that back to this group in a way that doesn't seem like shrouded and sort of nefarious, mm -hmm. the way that politics can seem, but is real and straightforward. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that, you know, that's that's what we're what we're working through. And I think that would that's a challenge in all states. Thanks. So my goals are for this process to produce real results that will benefit providers and ultimately the children, youth, and families that we serve. Through this process, once our needs are met, this field will ultimately grow. I want to see child care as a respected career. I want to see providers treated as the professionals that they are. I want to see the access for high quality child care expand. And I want the professionals in this field to be recognized for their commitment and expertise. So far, what is working well is our collaboration together. The team has been able to come up with real solutions that we believe will help providers across the state. We have established a sense of worth and unity through this process. Uh, working with DCYF has helped us educate one another on the issues at hand, and it has given providers a voice, and it feels like DCYF is listening to and validating our voices. Um, I just think as a whole, it's been productive. Um, you know, whether this happens or not, I just think that there's a lot of things that were brought to the forefront of the issues that we see. And um, that in itself has made it productive. So. Thank you. It sounds like uh, your process uh, is evolving, but also that, that your goals really have kind of shaped that process and the honesty, right, within that process of for providers to feel confident in being honest, but also from your perspective, Matt, of trying to really be as authentic and honest um, as you can be, right, within politics and how everything works. So mm -hmm. it sounds like that really has done, um, really helped shape and, and guide your process well. I am going to turn it over to Nina to talk a little bit about evaluation. Then we're going to come back to Autumn and Matt for just one final question. So go ahead, Nina. Heather, so it's a good idea just to kind of check in with yourselves on an ongoing basis about how things are going with engagement. So some of these questions that you might ask are, are we authentically engaging providers throughout the process? How do we know what's worked well and what could be improved? Who are we not hearing from and how could we reach them? That one's a big one. Um, how confident do we feel that the cost model accommodates the input and experiences of all childcare provider types? To what extent have our partners been engaged? Are there other partners we should engage? Think about agency partners and partners outside of government like philanthropy. 
Are we making progress toward our system focused goals and how do we know that we are? Have we communicated clearly with those impacted by this work? And have we sufficiently addressed questions and feedback on the cost modeling process and the report? Thank you. Those are all some really great questions for us to think about when we think about evaluating our engagement. So I'm going to turn it back to you, Matt and Autumn. So we'll start with Autumn. Uh, and if you want to share, what does success of the collaboration look like for you? Success of this collaboration would look like our proposals being taken into consideration and real solutions being created for the betterment of the childcare industry. I hope the work our team has put into this collaboration shines brightly, and I hope it sheds light on the real issues we face each day in this field. If this collaboration helps bring awareness and sparks change in this field, to me, we have been successful. I understand that our issues are not going to change overnight, but if the change continues even after we commence our time together, to me, that is success. Thank you. And for you, Matt? I, I think I've talked about some of mine, and so maybe now I'll turn to the future. Um, I don't see this necessarily as a one-off. Um, mm -hmm. We do a cost study every three years per CCDF requirements, or we will. And I think that this first one, um, you know, has merits in terms of inclusiveness and comprehensiveness of the provider community, but mm -hmm. but it isn't the end all be all. And groups like this, it doesn't. We don't necessarily have to take up Autumn's time again, if unless she wants to. But like, I'm not opposed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, groups like this um, could inform like what do these cost studies look like in the future? And um, there's already a broader context for this work. The legislature in Washington State um, directed our agency to come up with a plan by 2025 that we produce the plan in 2025 yeah. for uh, living wage and benefits for providers on the one hand and all families paying no more than 7% of their income for childcare, which would essentially be universal childcare. And so having rates that are based on the cost of care is an essential step mm -hmm. toward that, but only one piece of the puzzle. And so I think that hopefully the work we've done here provides a model for engaging people on the ground um, and and not just uh, you know our usual advisory structures, but getting a little bit deeper into community. Um, so we're already making plans for that um, by working with regional coalitions. I think that that's how we're going to get listening sessions and feedback sessions on a plan for universal early care and education. Um, and then I think that we will be back with. Uh, I would expect that we would be back with groups like the design team to think about this study in the future and to think about. Um, you know, cost of care as a broad topic and subsidy rates again in the future. So I think the goal is to establish something long lasting. Um, mm -hmm. for okay, thank you. Um, and I want to honor your time. And I know, Autumn, you have at least 11 children to get back to in your child care program. So I want to thank you so much, Matt and Autumn, for coming. Um, do you have any final thoughts you want to share before we wrap up? I think we covered it. <laughs> Perfect. All right. So I'm just going to take the, our last minute. I'm going to wrap up really quickly. So uh, to summarize some of the key points we heard, uh, engaging partners throughout the process is really important being authentic in your engagement really can give you more realistic information, but also honoring that providers do have the information that you need for your process and are the experts on that. Um, how you engage them, ensuring that you engage them um, is important and ensuring you engage the people that are impacted most by those decisions. Define and communicate your goals and evaluate your process, your, your progress towards those goals. And so I want to let everybody know that we will have another session that focuses on continuous improvement of cost estimation on January 17th of 2024. Um, so please save the date in your calendar. Uh, a reminder that there are resources available to you. So on the Child Care Technical Assistance Network webpage, there is an entire page available to CCDF lead agencies on alternative methodologies. And on that page, the recordings um, and PowerPoints from these sessions are posted uh, within a few weeks. So if you want to go back and watch the previous sessions, they're all posted on that page. And technical assistance is free and available to CCDF agencies. There is a QR code that you can use um, if you want to request that. 
or you can talk to your regional office or submit a request through the form. And some additional resources that we have used to gather this information for you from the University of Kansas and the Center for Rural Pennsylvania. And finally, I just want to thank everybody for joining us and again, encourage you to complete the evaluation that will pop up when we are done. And thank you so much and have a great day. And thank you, Autumn, and thank you, Matt. Thank you. Have a good day. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.